All right, Gen Chem students, we are going to talk about molecular shape and polarity for the next couple of days. Before we do that, I would really like to review a couple of things bet between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. So when we do that, I want to talk about ionic compounds really quick. So ionic compounds are where electrons are transferred. Okay, so electrons are transferred, meaning that we are taking electrons from a metal and making that metal a positive ion and giving those electrons to a nonmetal. Okay, so when we have a metal bound to a nonmetal, that is the best, most surefire way to understand that you have an ionic compound. Okay. Covalent compounds are bound, they're nonmetals bound to nonmetals. Okay, we have two main types of covalent compounds. We have polar, where the electrons are not shared evenly. So because those electrons are not shared evenly, we have a negative end on one side of the molecule and a positive end on the other side of the molecule. And that we got into last time when we were looking at the electronegativity differences between those two at atoms. If I have electronegativities that are somewhere between about 0.4 if that difference is greater than or equal to 0.4 between those two atoms and all the way up to about 1.7, I will have a polar molecule. But if I have a nonpolar molecule, that electronegativity difference is going to be less than 0.4, okay? So if I have an electronegativity difference that's less than 0.4, it will be a nonpolar molecule, which means that the electrons are shared evenly, okay? So that we don't get a positive end or a negative end on that molecule, okay? The other thing that we need to review before we start in on this is our valence electrons. So I want to go in on our periodic table and just review how many valence electrons each of the columns have. This should be really old hat by now, but let's just review this really quick. So here's our periodic table. I'm going to move this a little bit so we have a better understanding of what's going on. So when we look at the periodic table, remember the electrons that were on the outermost ring, the valence electrons, were designated by the position that things were in the periodic table. This first column had, column had one valence electron, okay? So we are putting in the number of valence electrons, okay? This second column has two valence electrons. And then we skipped over this transition metal block. Remember, we kind of skipped over that. And then we got to group 13. They had three valence electrons. And group 14 had four and 15 had five and so on until we were done. 16, 17 had seven, 16 had six. Now group 18 has eight for the most part. The exception to that is helium. Helium has two, okay? So our columns here going down 
just on the periodic table, we can tell you how many valence electrons each of these elements have, okay? So we're gonna review that really quickly. Let's go back in our notes, okay? So if I look back at my notes, we wanna draw the dot pictures. And remember the dot pictures, the Lewis dot pictures showed us the number of valence electrons that each of these elements have. So let's look up some of these elements really quickly. So A, we have helium, or not helium, hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen. So let's look for hydrogen. It's right here, it's in our very first column. So that meant it has one valence electron. So to show that one valence electron, I'm gonna put one dot by it. Now it really doesn't matter where you put the dot. You can put the dot to the right, to the top, to the left, or to the bottom. I like to start with my dots on the right-hand side and go around counterclockwise. Different chemists will start different places and it really only matters that you have one dot. The placement is not the important thing, okay? So let's look at bromine. So if we find bromine, we're here. So we have seven valence electrons on bromine. So I will place seven valence electrons on bromine. Oh, that wanted to slide. Let's start that over again. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so I want you to pause this video for a second See if you can find the valence electrons for the rest of these elements, and we'll come back in a minute and check, okay? All right, you ready to check? Okay, so argon. Let's look at argon. Argon's right here, so it has eight valence electrons. So we're going to put eight dots around argon. So notice, if we can use all four sides and each side can have up to two dots. So argon should have two dots to the top, two dots to the left, two dots to the right, and two dots to the bottom. Okay, sodium. Let's look up sodium. Sodium's right here. It has one valence electron because it's in the first column. So we only need to put one dot next to sodium. Okay, oxygen has six because it's in group 16. So we're gonna put six valence electrons around oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, and then calcium is right here in the second column. So we should have two valence electrons around calcium. Now I'm gonna put them on the same side because they're in the same orbital. We haven't really talked about orbitals. It's a quantum mechanics thing. But if you put them like this, separate, or you put calcium with one electron on either side, that's totally acceptable. I'm just, I'm gonna put them together. It's, it's a quantum mechanics thing. Don't worry about it, okay? So now we're going to start using these Lewis dot structures to create Lewis structures of molecules, okay? So the first thing we wanna do is draw the Lewis structure for hydrogen, okay? Now, if we look back up here, hydrogen has one dot. So if I have two of them, we're gonna draw one hydrogen with one dot, and I'm gonna change colors so that we can do another hydrogen. And here I've got another hydrogen with its electron, okay? So the idea of covalent structures, remember that the electrons are shared. And they're shared between the two atoms. So the idea is to get the two atoms close enough that the electron orbits around that nucleus overlap. So if I can get these two atoms close enough, this orange hydrogen can have the blue hydrogen's electron at least part of the time in its orbit, 
And the blue hydrogen can have the orange electrons in its orbit at least part of the time too. So by and large, these hydrogens now have two electrons that they can use. We sometimes will draw it like this, where this line means that we are sharing two, oh, let's do another, a better two, two electrons between the two hydrogen atoms, okay? Now let's think about this. If I have two electrons that this hydrogen can use, doesn't that give me a configuration like helium? Didn't we say when we were doing things last unit that having a configuration like these noble gases enabled atoms to be a lot more stable? So that's what we're really going to be doing. We're going to be sharing electrons in, to enable these atoms to get electron configurations that are like noble gases. So we have a couple of rules here. The biggest rule here is the octet rule. Okay, an octet means eight. And didn't you notice that in our periodic table, we have eight valence electrons for most of these noble gases? So we are going to try and create shared electrons so that each atom in a noble, or each atom in the molecule that we're drawing will have eight electrons. So atoms share electrons to achieve or have eight valence electrons or to achieve an octet. The exception to that is hydrogen or helium, okay? So the exception is hydrogen and helium. They share to achieve two. They have a duet, okay? So they will share to have a duet. So let's look at a little bit more complex molecule here. We're gonna look at ammonia, which is NH3. So the very first thing we need to do is figure out the number of valence electrons in each of these atoms. Now we have a nitrogen. So let's look at nitrogen. If we look at nitrogen, let's do yet another color. We have five valence electrons there. Okay, so we will have five valence electrons with our nitrogen. And hydrogen, when we look at hydrogen, this gives us one valence electron on hydrogen, right there. So for hydrogen, we will have one valence electron. Now, if you look at this three, that means we've got three hydrogens. So we need to multiply our hydrogens by three, okay? Now the next thing that we need to do is to add up all of these electrons together. So three times one gives me three, plus five gives me eight valence electrons total, okay? The next thing I need to do is I need to figure out what atom is going to be in the middle. Now, hydrogen can only do one bond since it can only do two electrons. So hydrogen will never be in the middle. So hydrogen is never in the middle. Okay, it can only do one bond. So the only other atom that I have to put in the middle here is nitrogen. So I'm gonna put nitrogen here in the middle. I'm going to put a single bond to each of these hydrogens. 
Now remember that when I do these bonds, they all mean that I've got two electrons being shared between the nitrogen and the hydrogen that it's bonded to. So each of these bonds that I have drawn in here are two electrons. So I am using two electrons here, two electrons here, and two electrons here. So I'm using six electrons, but I've got eight electrons. So where do I put the last two? Now to figure that out, I've got to figure out if I'm fulfilling the octet and the duet of the atoms that I have. So all the hydrogens have the two electrons that they need. They have their duets, but nitrogen needs an octet. So I tr the nitrogen has access to two, four, six electrons. It needs two more to have an octet. Remember, octet means eight. So I'm going to put the last electrons as two little dots on the top. Now these two little dots have a special name. So instead of being a bond, these two little dots are what we call a lone pair because they are not bonded to anything. So these are all single bonds. And the two little dots on top are called a lone pair. So that will be really important to, for you to distinguish between the two when we start talking about how these molecules have a three-dimensional shape. You're going to need to pay attention to how many lone pairs there are around that center atom and how many bonds or bonding areas there are around that center atom, okay? So let's look at methane. So methane is one carbon and four hydrogens. So let's look at carbon really quick. Carbon's right here. It has four valence electrons. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna put four valence electrons with the carbon and we're gonna put hydrogen having one valence electron. Now, you see that we have four hydrogens there. So I need to multiply that by four to get all those hydrogens in there. So we're gonna add all of these electrons up four from the carbon and four times one is four as well. So four plus four is eight valence electrons. Okay, so we've got eight total valence electrons. Now, we said that hydrogen is never in the middle. So the only other option to have in the middle is carbon. So I'm gonna draw it kind of over here. I'm gonna put a single bond to each of these hydrogens. I've got four of them, so that we're going to have four single bonds. Now remember, each of these single bonds is two electrons. So I've got two electrons there, I've got two electrons here, and I've got two electrons here, and I've got two electrons here. So that's eight total electrons. Those two electrons on each of these bonds are being shared with the hydrogen, so the hydrogen has its duet, and carbon also has eight electrons. Four times two is eight, so carbon has its octet. So that is the Lewis structure for methane, CH4. Now notice in this structure, we have four bonds, and we have zero lone pairs. Okay? So let's look at water, our next one. So we have oxygen and we have hydrogen. We've already talked about hydrogen, and we know that hydrogen has one valence electron. In water, we've got two of them, so we're gonna multiply that by two. And then when, let's look at oxygen. Oxygen's right here, which means that we have six valence electrons. So oxygen gives us six valence electrons. 
So 2 plus 6 gives us a grand total of 8 valence electrons. Now, the trick is, what's in the middle? Hopefully, you are coming to the conclusion that hydrogen can never be in the middle. So we're going to put oxygen in the middle. So here's oxygen in the middle. We're going to do a single bond to the two hydrogens. So that gives me two electrons right there and two electrons right there. I still have four more electrons to make. Now these hydrogens are already full. So I'm going to have to put these four other electrons on the oxygen. And I'm going to have to put them in on the oxygen as lone pairs. So there's one, two, three, four electrons on that oxygen. Okay. So I now have one, two, three, four uh, electrons with the lone pairs. I have two electrons here for six and two more right here for a total of eight. So I've placed all eight of my electrons. The hydrogens are full. The oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons. So its octet is full. So that is going to be our structure for water. So when we look at the bonds here, we have two bonds and we have two lone pairs on our Lewis structure of water. Okay, so here's the trick. Here are the different steps that you saw me going through when we created Lewis structures for these molecules. The first thing we need to do is count all the valence electrons in the molecule. That means each atom, each atom in that molecule, we have to count all those valence electrons and add them all together so that we know how many valence electrons we are using. The second thing is we need to decide which atom goes in the middle. Remember that nature tends to be symmetrical. Symmetrical means it's balanced on each side. So one side should be about equal with the other side. And that hydrogen can only have one pair of electrons, okay, or two electrons total. The center atom is usually the least electronegative atom except hydrogen. So usually we can look at electronegativity and decide which atom is going to be in the middle. The exception to that rule is hydrogen. Hydrogen's always, always going to be at the edge of whatever molecule that we're at. It's never going to be in the middle. The next thing we've got to do is we've got to place a pair of electrons between the center atom and each bonding atom. So we create single bonds and notice I used up to four sides, okay? So I can use the top, the right, the left, the bottom. I can use up to four sides in placing bonds. Then we need to complete the Lewis structure by giving each atom a full octet. Remember octet means eight electrons or four pairs. Now they could be a lone pair or they could be a bonding pair, but the center atom has to have four pairs of electrons around it, okay? Remember, hydrogen only needs one pair, okay? Hydrogen and helium only need one pair, but everything else is gonna need four pairs around it. There are some exceptions. Hydrogen needs one pair, let's see, Beryllium will do two pairs, and boron will do three pairs. But other than that, everything else needs four pairs of electrons around it. Next, finally count all of your dots, i.e. the lone pairs, and the bonds. 
If the structure is correct, the number of dots and bonds should equal the number of valence electrons that we counted up earlier. If not, the structure is incorrect and we have to try something else. Okay, so we're going to practice here. We're going to draw some loose structures for the following molecules. Now the first thing always is to get our Lewis structure or get our valence counts. Okay, so we're going to look at phosphorus here. Okay, so phosphorus is right here, which means it has five valence electrons. And we have hydrogen again, which has one. So phosphorus has five valence electrons, and hydrogen has one, but we've got three hydrogens, okay? So one times three is three plus five gives us a grand total of eight valence electrons. Now the next thing is to figure out what's gonna be in the middle. Hopefully you said phosphorus, right? Phosphorus is gonna be in the middle. I'm gonna draw a single bond to each of the three hydrogens. Okay, so that means I have placed two, four, six of my eight electrons right there. Hydrogens are all full because they can only have two electrons, and there's two electrons in each of those bonds. But phosphorus needs two more to have its octet. So I'm going to put phosphorus's octet there. So I now have used eight electrons. Phosphorus now has its octet, and the hydrogens are each full as well with their duets. So in this, I have, I have three bonds on phosphorus trihydride, and I have one lone pair. Okay? Let's move on. We've got carbon tetrachloride here. So let's look at carbon and let's look at chlorine. So carbon and chlorine, we need to get their valence electron counts. Okay, so carbon, we already saw, has four valence electrons. Chlorine has seven. So carbon has four valence electrons and chlorine has seven. Now the thing is, we've got four chlorines, so we're gonna multiply that by four. Okay, now we need to add it up. So seven times four is 28, plus four more is 32. That's a lot of electrons. Now, the next thing to determine is what's gonna be center? We need to look at electronegativity. Now remember, the trend for electronegativity was this. Oh, that didn't, that was still pink. The trend for electronegativity is this, okay? So remember, fluorine was our absolute most electronegative element, okay? So we're gonna see which one's closer to fluorine between carbon and, oops, between carbon and um, chlorine. Now chlorine's only one step away from chlorine, and here fluorine is three steps away from carbon. So carbon is going to be not nearly as electronegative as the chlorine. So we're gonna put carbon in the middle. So I'm gonna put carbon in the middle and I'm gonna draw a single bond to each of the chlorines. Okay, so I've put in four single bonds, which has used up eight of my electrons. And those eight electrons are all useful to carbon. So that means carbon's full, it's got its octet. But each of the chlorines only has two electrons and they need eight. So that means that I need to put six electrons around each of the chlorines, and they're all going to be parts of lone pairs. 
So I'm going to put three lone pairs around each of the chlorines. Okay, so when I do that, that means each of these chlorines have two, four, six, eight electrons. And each of the chlorines are the same. So if I have eight electrons around this one, I'll also have eight electrons around this one, and around this one, and around this one. So 4 times 8 is 32, which I have definitely used all 32 of my electrons. Now when we look at this molecule, all four sides are bonding. So I have four bonds and zero lone pairs on this one. Okay, let's look at hydrogen fluoride, our next one. Change color here. Okay, so we've already determined multiple times that hydrogen has one valence electron. Okay, fluorine, let's look at fluorine here. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. So fluorine has seven. So one plus seven gives me a total of eight valence electrons. Now I only have two atoms, so I don't really have a center. With two atoms, you can only create a line. So I have hydrogen bound to fluorine. With that bond, hydrogen's already full with the two electrons that it shares with the fluorine. The fluorine has those two electrons too, but fluorine has an octet. So I need to put the other six electrons that I'm not picturing around the fluorine so the fluorine can complete its octet. Okay, so in this molecule, I have one bond. And that's okay, because I really don't have a center atom. So that's a pretty simple molecule. Let's move on to hydrogen sulfide. So if I look at hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen gives me one valence electron, but I've got two of them, so I'm gonna multiply that by two. Let's look at sulfur. Sulfur is right here, which gives me six valence electrons. Oh. Sulfur has six. So when I put the two from the hydrogen with the six for the sulfur, it gives me eight valence electrons total. Now, the next thing is to determine what's in the middle. Hopefully you said sulfur. So I'm gonna put single bonds to each of these hydrogens, okay? So the hydrogens are full because they can only have the two electrons that are in this single bond. The sulfur though, has two bonds, which gives it access to four electrons, but it needs an octet. So I'm gonna put the four extra electrons that we have as lone pairs on the sulfur, okay? So that now gives this sulfur two, four, six, eight electrons. So the sulfur has now satisfied its octet and I'm using all eight of the electrons. So this is indeed the Lewis structure for hydrogen sulfide. So when I look at this, I've got two areas that are lone pairs. So I have two lone pairs. And I've got two bonds. I've got two single bonds. on that structure, okay? So let's look at silicon tetrafluoride here. So silicon, let's look at the 
valence electrons for both silicon and fluoride. So if I look at silicon, I'm right here with four valence electrons and fluorine has seven. So four for silicon and seven for fluorine. But I've got four fluorine, so I'm gonna multiply that by four. So four times seven is 28, plus the four more for the silicon will give me 32 total. Now the thing is, I wanna put the least electronegative atom in the center. So if we look at where silicon is, compared to fluorine, fluorine is the most electronegative atom out there, period. So it's not gonna be in the middle. So silicon, we're going to put silicon in the middle. So I'm going to put silicon in the middle, and I'm going to draw a single bond to each of these fluorines. Okay. Now, silicon now has four bonds to it with two electrons in each bond, which two times four gives me eight electrons. So that means silicon already has its octet. Fluorine though, on each of these fluorines, they only have access to two electrons in each of those bonds. So fluorine, they all need six more electrons to fill their octets. So I'm gonna fill up their octets by putting three lone pairs on each of the fluorines. So they all have access to eight electrons and have their octets. Okay, so if I want to count up my electrons now, each fluorine now has two, four, six, eight electrons. And each of these fluorines are the same. So if I have four fluorines, right, eight electrons times four, one, two, three, four, that gives me 32 electrons. So that is the Lewis structure here for silicon tetrafluoride. Around that center atom, I've got four bonds. So I have four single bonds, which gives me zero lone pairs. zero lone pairs. Okay, now would be a good time for you to stop the video and do the next couple on your own and see if you can do them. Okay, you ready to check? All right, I have fluorine. It's bonded to itself right here. So let's look at fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. So fluorine gives me seven valence electrons and I've got two of them. So seven times two gives me 14 total. So I'm gonna put fluorine and I'm gonna bind it to itself. Right now, the fluorines are sharing two electrons. So each of the fluorines have two electrons that they can use, but they need eight, they need an octet. So I'm gonna put three lone pairs on each of the fluorines to fill up the octets. Okay, now, how many electrons have I used? Let's count them up. I've used two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 electrons, which is what I've got. The octets are satisfied. So this is the Lewis structure for fluorine. Notice, because I only have two atoms, I don't have a center atom. So I only have one bond here, one single bond here. All right, let's move on to nitrogen trifluoride, okay? Nitrogen, did you see that it had five valence electrons? Yep, I've got five valence electrons for nitrogen and I've got seven for fluorine. So five valence electrons for the nitrogen and for fluorine, I've got seven. But I've got to multiply that fluorine by three because I've got three fluorides there. 
So 7 times 3 will give me 21, plus 5 gives me a grand total of 26 valence electrons. Now, to determine what's going to be in the middle, I want to look at what's not, what's the least electronegative. Fluorine is my most, my absolute most electronegative. So nitrogen's less electronegative, so I'm going to put nitrogen in the middle. Okay, so I've got single bonds to each of the fluorines. That gives my nitrogen two, four, six electrons that it can use. It needs two more to have its octet, so I'm gonna put a lone pair on that. Now, each of the fluorines only have two electrons that they can use. They want their octet too, so to fill up their octet, I'm gonna put three lone pairs on each of the fluorines to give them six more electrons. Okay, so now each of the fluorines have access to eight electrons, um, six electrons in the lone pairs and two electrons in the bonds. And I've got three fluorines that each have eight. So eight, eight electrons for this first fluorine eight electrons for this bottom fluorine, and eight electrons for this fluorine to the right. Eight times three is 24, plus these two electrons here on top of the nitrogen, that gives me my 26. So I've used all 26, and I've satisfied the octets for everybody. So let's look at around that center atom of nitrogen. So if I look around that center atom of nitrogen here, I've got three single bonds. So I've got three bonds, and I've got one lone pair. Okay, now the, this next one might be a bit confusing because I don't just have two different elements in here. I've got three. So let's break it down piece by piece. We've got carbon, we've got hydrogen, and we've got chlorine. We've got three chlorines, so we're gonna need to multiply our chlorine by three. So let's look at carbon and hydrogen and chlorine. So carbon has four valence electrons, hydrogen has one, and chlorine right here has seven. So four, one, and seven. So carbon has four valence electrons, hydrogen has one, and chlorine has seven. So we're gonna add all of those up. And remember, we're multiplying the chlorine by three because we've got three chlorines, chlorines. So three times seven gives me 21, plus one more is 22, plus four more is 26. So I've got 26 valence electrons. Now, I've got to figure out what's gonna be in the middle. And carbon and chlorine are the only ones in the running because hydrogen can never be in the middle. So let's look and see which one is the, le the less electronegative. So I've got carbon right here. And I've got chlorine that's right next to the fluorine. So carbon's farther away from the fluorine, so carbon's going to be less electronegative. So I'm going to put carbon in the middle. So carbon's going to be the middle. I'm going to put the three chlorines with single bonds, and I'm going to put a single bond to the hydrogen. Okay? So I have used four pairs of electrons, which gives me eight, and they're all going to the carbon. So that means carbon is full. It's got the eight electrons that it needs already. Hydrogen's also got a pair of electrons, which is all it can do. So I know the hydrogens and the carbon are full, but the chlorines only have two electrons each that they are using. So they need six more to satisfy their octets. So I'm gonna put three lone pairs on each of the chlorines to give the chlorines their octets, or their eight electrons. Okay? Now, everyone's octets or duets are satisfied. Now, let's count up 
the amount of electrons that I have used. I've used two, four, six, eight, nine, ten, sorry, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen electrons, eighteen, twenty, twenty two, twenty four, and twenty six electrons. So I have used up all 26 of my electrons. So let's look at that center atom. That center atom has four bonds around it. So I have four bonds or single bonds. And I have zero lone pairs around that center atom. Okay? So in your homework today, you are going to be doing those structures like this and figuring out how many bonds there are, how many valence electrons there are, and doing all the things that we've been doing today. So good luck, and if you have questions, please email me. We'll see you. Bye.